John, thank you for joining me. Um, lots of people are familiar with your name now because you've done a couple of very high profile debates with Richard Dawkins. Um, many people perhaps see you as his opposite number in some ways, um, also an Oxford professor by background, but one who obviously differs significantly in your attitude to faith and belief. Um, tell us, bring it back to the start. How did it start for you? Did you have a Christian faith growing up? Um, was it something you came at later on? Yes, I had a Christian faith growing up. My parents were evangelical Christians, so were their parents in Northern Ireland. I think the unique feature of my growing up was that my parents, though convinced Christians, gave me space to think and encouraged me to read very widely other worldviews other than Christian. And so I came up to university having read a great deal, probably more than the average Christian might have. And it was at Cambridge that I got involved very early on in the public defense of Christianity, in a sense. I was challenged at my first week at Cambridge. Somebody asked me, did I believe in God? And then they said, of course you do, you're Irish. And they all <laughs> believe in God over there. They fight about it. I'd heard the question before. But somehow I felt at that time it was important to settle it at a deeper level. So I deliberately set about getting to know, befriending, talking to people who didn't share my worldview. And I've been doing it ever since. Absolutely. What were some of the biggest questions you came across as you befriended people with other worldviews? Well, it's ultimately a question of truth. Is the Christian faith true? And of course, I'm a scientist. So in one sense, historically, I'm very prejudiced in favor of Christianity because it was belief in God that arguably set science going, modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the rational intelligibility of the universe for me is one of the great evidences that there is a God. The fact that we can do science, so to speak, is evidence for God. And so I was interacting not simply with scientific people who felt that the evidence was the other way, and I wanted to know what that evidence was, but also with with people in the humanities who had different views, views that were relativistic, sometimes views that were essentially communist, Marxist, and so on. And by constantly asking myself questions and exposing my faith in God to these alternative views, the effect of it was over the years to strengthen my faith in God, uh, that Christianity in the end was by far and away the best explanatory fit at that level. And then, of course, there's the personal dimension as well, the experience of God in my own daily life. I, th I think many people probably almost go a completely different route. They think, if I'm going to keep my faith secure, I need to shield it from any other points of view. That gives rise to a sort of Christian bubble very often. Yes, it does. It develops a ghetto mentality and it's very sad because the very first commandment after all is to love the Lord our God with our mind and it's sad because it indicates that people somehow feel that they might learn something that is true that upsets them but if there is a God he is the truth and after all, one of the central claims of Jesus himself was, I am the truth. Not simply, I speak true things, although that's true. It's I am the truth, that he is the ultimate truth. And I regard myself at that level on a kind of quest. What is ultimate truth? What is ultimate reality? And to be afraid of something new seems to me to contradict the very thing I'm supposed to believe in. You've been unafraid in a sense of linking scientific evidences to proofs for God. Some people sort of are very keen to shy away from that. They say you shouldn't mix up God and science. God is, uh, the, the concepts of God and theology are asking certain questions, answering certain questions, and science is a completely different sphere, if you like. But but you don't see it that way. You do no, see I that don't. there are... I disagree entirely with Stephen Jay Gould, who talked about non-overlapping magisteria. I, I think there is a grain of truth in that. Crudely put, science tends to answer the how questions and Christianity deals with the deeper why questions. But that's not good enough for a very simple reason, that the Bible does talk about the physical universe. It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It says uh, in the beginning was the word. All things came to be through him. In other words, it's making a comment on the genesis of the universe and life as we know it. So there is an overlap. The second thing is that the Apostle Paul in his 
central defense of the Christian gospel, the letter he wrote to Rome, says that the invisible things of God, that is his great power and his Godhead, the fact that there is a God, are clearly seen from the things that are made. In other words, Paul, as one of his first arguments, first arguments in his defense of the Christian message says that the universe provides a perception. It's not neutral in the question of God. And that's an axiom for me, really, that I expect to see signs of God's action, activity in the universe itself. Going to Dawkins and the debates you've had with him, he, he and his fellow sort of atheist scientists, many of them want to say these days that science has, if you like, given us pause to question God, that, 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 that in fact, if anything, science leads to atheism. Um, you have obviously saying something quite different. If anything, science is opening up questions that make us wonder, well, perhaps there is a God after all. Now, wh why is that voice of the atheist scientist so persuasive at the moment? We seem to be getting multiple newspaper articles, books coming out from atheists who, who, who are wanting to bang this drum about science leading towards non-belief in God. What? What, what's the cause, as far as you see it, for this suddenly being the, the tenor of, of the scientific community at the moment? Well, I don't think it's the complete tenor of the scientific community. It's that there are a few very strident voices in the scientific community. And I notice that some of those voices are distancing themselves increasingly from the branch of atheism that Dawkins is representing. You're quite right. He claims to be able to effectively deduce his atheism from science. I actually think it's nonsense, and nonsense in a very strict sense, because if his atheism is true, it means that the mind that he thinks his atheism up with is simply the human brain, and the brain is the product of an unguided, mindless process, and is philosophers are increasingly pointed out that gives him a major cognitive problem because the process that produced his brain was not geared to truth that was geared to reproductive success and so his argument taken to its logical conclusion undermines the very rationality that you need to do science let alone anything to do with god so I feel his atheism is logically incoherent and self-destructive. I know that's a pretty strong <laughs> statement, but that's the way it seems to be. It has become very popular. These books are popular. But I suspect there's an element other than the scientific involved in that popularity. There is a moral rebellion in the human heart against God, and we've got to take that on board as well. And there is a sense in which many people want atheism to be true. And I think that's a very important thing to analyze. There's a brilliant book, a bestseller in Germany at the moment, uh, by a psychiatrist called Manfred Lutz. It's called A Short History of the Great One. And he makes the point that Freud gives you a brilliant analysis of why religion is a delusion, provided God doesn't exist. <laughs> But if God does exist, Freud gives you an equally brilliant analysis of the fact that atheism is a delusion. And it's a very powerfully written book. And his punchline is, but on the question of whether God exists or not, Freud won't help you at all. There you have to go for the evidence. And that, for me, is a key thing. Dawkins me thinks he protests too much. He insists on evidence. But I don't see him taking seriously the evidence the intellectual evidence for Christianity, certainly not in his recent book, The God Delusion. And That's why I wrote my book, God's Absolutely. Undertaker. And presumably the reason why you're involved with things like the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, you're looking to equip Christians to answer the questions of non-Christians and, and also to put that worldview as being a rational one, that we don't have to buy into a kind of atheist scientific scientific mentality. Yes, I want to share with the Christian population in general the fact that there's no need at all to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of the good news, of belief in God and the Bible, because it fits with science and there are answers. I don't say they're exhaustive answers, but answers to these deep questions of life sufficient to really found your life on. And I try as best I can to, in public and in private, to encourage people to think hard 
about these things. Well, thank you for helping us to think, John, and thanks for being with me today. Not at all. It's a pleasure, Justin.